morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Roger Tatoud. I am Deputy Director in the HIV Program and Advocacy Department at the EIS, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today, all our participants and our panelists, to this four panel, fourth panel discussion in our series of online events on design approaches for current and future HIV prevention efficacy trials. Today, we continue previous panel discussion led by Holly Jens and Deborah Donnell on clinical trials for new biologics. Please note that all participants are muted. We encourage you to send your question to our panelists at any time through the Q&A box that you can bring up with the icon at the bottom of this screen. Please remember to focus your question on today's webinar, webinar's theme. If you have other questions, we encourage you to send them to the enterprise at iasociety.org email. If you're having issue with Zoom, post your question in the chat box, which is different from the Q&A. I am now handing over to Deborah Donner from the Fred Hutch to open today's panel discussion. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, in this, in this sequence of talks about, um, discussion of talks about future FC trial design approaches, we're focusing today on uh, the design and statistical analysis methods supporting estimation of HIV prevention efficacy for future active control trials. So I, um, prior to this, we, have, we hope that you have um, listened to each of these five talks, which illustrate various statistical analysis approaches to these future active arm control trials. And we have these five panelists with us today. So Faye, um, just to remind you if it's been a while since you watched the talks or to motivate you to go watch the talks afterwards, um, Faye is talking about how we might design a trial that used um, recency assays to estimate HIV incidence. Sheila is uh, talking about a setting that's in the field at the moment that's, that's using a registrational cohort to get a handle on HIV incidence. Alex and Dave and Peter all talked about methods of bridging from prior placebo controlled trials to future active controlled trials. Um, Alex did it in the context of vaginal rings. Dave did it in the context of um, tenofovir, uh, Truvada, um, Truvada uh, for prevention, and Peter in the future context for vaccines. Um, all of those talks are available in this place um, in the link that I've given here. Um, and I'm going to attempt to kind of summarize how these all fit together to help us um, give a background for what we're going to be discussing in this next hour. So I, I want to point out that our focus at the moment is active controlled HIV prevention trials that are going to be conducted in the future. We still have placebo controlled trials going on, especially in the vaccine trials field, and we're not talking about that. Um, the challenges for future active controlled HIV prevention trials, so that's where everybody in the trial is on an active control or an uh, experimental that we are trying to estimate its efficacy. The challenges of these future trials are going to be that the observed incidence is anticipated to be quite low, which means it's very challenging to adequately power a traditional randomized clinical trial. And then if you don't have an internal placebo control within the trial, interpreting low incidence in both arms is pretty challenging. Last, quantifying relative efficacy of different interventions is really challenging when the incidence is low. So these talks, these five talks are presenting different concepts for leveraging data sources that are actually external to the trial to infer prevention efficacy of an experimental intervention relative to what we're calling a counterfactual placebo. So um, courtesy of Holly, I'm gonna walk you through this diagram that tries to put all these concepts together. So on the left-hand side here is this, the, what, we're, what we currently have, which is historical placebo-controlled trials that have shown efficacy. So um, what I'm showing on the y-axis is HIV incidence rate. So the placebo incidence rate was higher than the active control. And we had effective uh, prevention efficacy for proving prevention efficacy for the active control. On the right hand side, we have what we're imagining is going to happen where we have an active control trial. So the active control from the historical is, is present in the new trial and we're adding an experimental and we're wanting to see what the efficacy, whether or not this experimental is, uh, is, is uh, efficacious in preventing HIV. So some of the ideas that were discussed in the talks is prior or during the screening of the new trial, we could be um, 
looking, um, measuring in HIV incidence in a registrational cohort. We could also use HIV recency assays to measure incidence in the people enroll um, screening for the trial. And based on these um, measurements in the population, we might be able to come up with a counterfactual placebo incidence. And based on that, come up with a counterfactual prevention efficacy for both the active control, which can be compared back to what has happened historically, and the prevention efficacy for the experimental. There are also approaches that are discussed where we take the prevention efficacy for the active control in the historical trials and bridge it to the prevention efficacy in the future trial, where this bridging is based on the use of um, baseline factors and time varying uh, covariates. And in particular, it's very powerful if we have a mediator that describes or um, characterizes the prevention efficacy that was observed in the active control. So broadly, uh, some of the language we'll be using, we talk about bridging information from an external setting, where the external setting could be an earlier time point for the same population or a similar population in a different setting. And that bridging is usually based on covariance. Um, um, when we're talking about bridging from an external setting to the current setting of an active controlled trial, also most talks are using a constancy assumption. And that constancy assumption is usually, is, is either that HIV incidence has remained relatively constant throughout the period spanning the historical to the current active control, or that the prevention efficacy that was observed in historical placebo controls trials remains constant for um, the active control trial and the counterfactual placebo. So those are, that's a kind of a broad summary of the ideas that we're gonna be discussing today. So um, I'm just, just sort of summarizing here. We've got this idea of a registrational cohort, which is capturing pretrial HIV incidence in the current population. Regist a recency assay at trial screening also captures pretrial HIV incidence in the current population. Um, the concepts of identifying using mediators of efficacy for the active control to bridge from the historical placebo controls to the active control, where this might be ARV based uh, in the ARV based setting the mediators time bearing adherence. In the MAB and vaccines, it's a time bearing immune biomarker. <clears throat> We're also discussing methods for incorporating matching or adjustments using baseline and time bearing covariates, representing the risk of HIV um, exposure and methods that formally combine all these different external data sources. So with that as an introduction, I'm going to um, stop sharing and we're going to get on to the discussion with our speakers. Thank you, Deborah. So I'm going to lead us through some questions and, and for each of the, the panelists, if you'd like to take, you know, maybe just one sentence and introduce yourself before, before you start your comments, that would be welcome. Um, so, so I think I'll start with posing some questions to, to Sheila and Faye to begin and, and, and um, <clears throat> probe about this constancy assumption that, that Deborah mentioned. And I wonder if each of you could, could take a moment and, um, and discuss this constancy assumption and the distinction, as Deborah mentioned, between um, making an assumption about constancy <clears throat> of HIV incidence between the um, external setting and the current setting versus the assumption of constancy and efficacy of the active control intervention. And you may wanna make reference to the assumption that you were using in your talk versus others. You know, what are the pros and cons of these assumptions, perhaps commenting on, on their validation. So, so first, Charlie, starting with Sheila. Yes, thank you, Holly and Deborah for the introductions. Um, my name is Sheila Kansime. I am a biostatistician and an epidemiologist working at the MRC UVRI, primarily on the PREPVAC trial, registration cohort and trial. I am also currently completing a PhD at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Yeah, so back to your question. Um, this, in your, your question is in regard, in regard to this constancy assumption of you carry out, you conducted this cohort or this trial in probably a population in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now you're doing a trial probably in the UK and you want to use the data from probably this cohort in Sub-Saharan Africa to inform this, the, the trial, the HIV vaccine or prevention trial in the UK. My first comment about a scenario like that is, is it even possible? Would, would even the results be believable? And if we're to leave, um, just not focus only on the HIV incidence constancy assumption, 
an assumption of even the prevention efficacy of an intervention. For example, I assume we saw we use probably Trivada in this population and had this level of efficacy. So we're going to use that to inform um, our trial. I don't think that would apply across populations. For example, if the, the initial cohort was done in the UK, probably in a cohort of MSM, and now our trial is probably in a cohort of sub-Saharan African heterosexual women, the, 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 the way these, the, the interventions work is different. The way the level of efficacy they'd have would define these two populations. So that's when I question of, is it even possible to, to make that um, constancy assumption and those comparisons? Lucky, no. So for the PrepVac registration cohort, we're able to do this, the cohort in the same exact population that we intend to do to include in the trial. So if you're eligible for the, if you're in the cohort, you're likely considered to be somewhat eligible for the trial. So there's a lot of similarity and overlap. Most of the people, all the people who will be in the trial will be from the cohort. So that's, that makes the constancy assumption hold in our case. Um, in regards to the pros to the approach, I think that the overall pro really here is we're trying to figure out how to minimize sample size. So if, if it works well, well and good, that should be an advantage. The sample size required to power a child, but the, to me, the coins would outweigh the, the advantages of, of, up, of an approach where really these settings are different and the efficacy is different. I, I don't know what they would say about this. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is Fei Gao. I'm now a assistant professor of health statistics at the Vaccine and Infectious Diseases uh, Division in the Fred Hodge. Uh, so, uh, uh, so regarding this question, I have a slightly different uh, uh, aspect compared to Sheila. So when I first considered this type of question, one thing is like for this approaches that we uh, breach the prevention efficacy among uh, the existing, uh, the, the, this current trial versus the historical trial. So one key component is that we definitely need there is an active control arm that's shared by both the current study and the historical study. So for example, for example, in the future, if we want to comp, uh, implement a trial with active product and also with active control, if we are choosing to use CapTagware, which is uh, a product where we, in, in the trial of uh, evaluating efficacy of the, this CapTagware, we don't have a, 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 a placebo in that trial, for example, in PDN 083, 084. So in that case, how to bridge this new intervention compared to CapTagware, which also need bridging will be a more complicated problem there. So in that case, definitely uh, there is some limitation of what active control we can include in the virtual trial when we want to evaluate this efficacy. So another thing is about this uh, active control treatment in the two studies. They need to be, even though they may be a, a same study, for example, we may all take a TDFFTC, but need, they need to be implemented the same. Or at least there is, uh, if there's any variation of treatment, it should be captured by the covariance included in the analysis. For example, uh, the adherence level uh, that, uh, for example, Alex have used to try to connect this uh, different variation of TDFFTC. Uh, so in that case, if this adherence is also needed in order to uh, implement this type of analysis, we like to make sure that this adherence is measured exactly the same way to capture this, uh, to have this consistency assumption make sense. For example, when we sample for the TFFTC adherence, we need to make sure that the sampling scheme of these two studies are comparable. And also the assay we use, for example, drop loss follower plasma, they're matched. Therefore, this, uh, uh, this uh, controlling for adherence for uh, eliminating variation of the treatment can be conducted. So on the other hand, for the other type of study that is making use of the constancy of uh, HIV instance over time, one drawback is that it's really limited to what kind of uh, population we are working on. So basically we require that the population we evaluate this active product should be approximately in the stable HIV epidemic. So the, the HIV instance should be relatively constant or problem should be relatively constant for this residency acid type of approach or restriction of cohort type of approach to make sense. So therefore it is not something that we can work on to implement in our, so it's not something that we can control, rather it really depends on the population. 
So in that case, uh, we this assumption we need, and this assumption may be assessed, for example, by other type of surveillance data. And we want to make sure that this constancy assumption really holds in those populations. Thanks, Faye. So, 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 um, th so relatedly, you know, um, uh, several of these methods that you, that use these time varying covariates, um, Dave's method that used the the time varying um, uh, drug levels in the blood, Peter's method that used the um, the time varying uh, immune Im immune um, biomarkers. Uh, to to capture uh, efficacy of the vaccine um, are, are um, in in some way assuming media a mediation that this that this biomarker is a mediator of a prevention efficacy. So so I'd like um, several of our speakers to to comment on this mediation framework um, and and in particular to um, to discuss the, the 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 similarities and differences between the, the frameworks that were employed for the ARV based uh, biomarkers and the immune based biomarkers. Um, and and the um, you know the, the similarities and differences and, and connections perhaps between these these frameworks that were employed you know for the different fields um, maybe starting with with Dave first sure I'd say in contrast to the other approaches not identify I've not emphasized the identifiability issues that the attention to that causal diagram and some of the issues of what would license uh, the mediation, what would license the bridging. Instead, I emphasized working assumptions through a prior distribution on the bridging effect of the drug levels, combined with the possibility of doing sensitivity analysis. So that prior specification has a lot of flexibility in how you do it. It's my intent to post the full data set online to allow other people to derive their own priors for that. And I really wanted to stress in mind is that if we're thinking about bridging, taking data from one context to another, remember there's original uncertainty in that first data set. And Bayes is a great form framework for taking uncertainty from one data set to another. And it was one that I saw that had a lot of important advantages. Just a little bit on mediation. Mediation, as far as drug levels in a PrEP context, at face value, straightforward. It's a mediator. Our complications are twofold. One is that we expect that there are things that affect both the mediator and the outcome. And these might be things like age or HIV risk practices. We must attend to those. I think I did in how I dropped the prior. And the second one is that there is no unambiguous HIV drug level. The relevant drug level is one that occurs at a time of HIV exposure. And there are many ways to measure drug levels, all of which are in different compartments using different modalities that really at best are a mismeasured covariate of, of what truly affects the bridging. So those are the two threats, I see. Great, thanks. And Alex, can you can you comment on um, what you see are the, the, you know, some key differences um, between the, the ARV drug levels and the, and the immune biomarkers um, and, and the employment of this, this mediation framework? So, so maybe, maybe to, to start uh, with some similarities and differences with Dave's talk. So, so I really liked in Dave's talk um, the, the, the sort of Bayesian approach and the ability to incorporate prior knowledge. So if, if you compare that to Peter and my talks, um, I guess we incorporated prior knowledge in, in a very frequent display and we were somewhat limited in, in what prior knowledge we, we did choose to impose. Um, so, so I imposed a time constancy assumption. Um, Peter imposed a perfect mediation condition. E each of these conditions um, does require prior knowledge to actually believe them and, and to, to sort of uh, check their validity. Um, however, I think Dave's framework is a lot more flexible. So it would be interesting to see if, if there's a more Bayesian approach to both Peter and my settings where, where we can incorporate more knowledge that maybe is specialized to each setting. In, in terms of the applicability of the various methods to say vaccine or PrEP studies, e each of the methods in, in my view is applicable to each of these settings without too much um, modification. We, we would need to inspect the, the assumptions in each setting, um, but, but, but I do think that that 
I think we, we each focus on a particular setting because that's what motivated our development of the method, but that they are, each one does appear more broadly applicable to me. And then maybe just to, to briefly talk about, um, to, to, to contrast with, with Peter's some, so, so Peter's method was very interesting in that it, it didn't require a, a previous trial, um, which I, I think is, is especially nice in, in settings where you're working in, in a new population um, where, where perhaps the, the bridge is very long and so, so you don't have any similar trial to work with. Um, th though it, a difference perhaps and a challenge to that method would come in cases where, um, so, so, so a, a key aspect of, of Peter's method was, was to leverage those individuals who say in, in, the, in the vaccine context had no immune response or a very low immune response so that we could essentially just treat them as placebos under this perfect, perfect mediation assumption. And there's a natural challenge here where you, you do need to have enough such individuals in your trial that, that, that you have enough placebo type cases um, to work with. Um, so, so that I think um, would be a, a challenge of a pure mediation approach, although there's also this nice sort of purity of it, um, where if you truly believe that, that the entire effect is mediated through, through say an immune response, um, you, you can essentially behave as though you have placebos in your new trial. Um, so I think just from a statistical power perspective, uh, it, it, it may face some challenges in certain settings, though not in all of them. Thanks, Alex. So, so Peter, can you comment on the on the different uh, frameworks that were that were discussed with respect to ARV biomarkers and immune biomarkers? So, yeah, I'm Peter Gilbert. I'm a professor of biostatistics at the Fred Hutchinson University of Washington. Um, yeah, there's several common elements of these three methods. They're all estimating counterfactual placebo incidents. You know, they're all transparent in their assumptions, and they all need sensitivity analysis, and and that can be added to all the methods. Um, they all need to capture the right baseline covariates and uh, the right um, mediator, wh wh whether it's a fixed time point or a time time varying. Uh, but but they use those data in different ways. Uh, like Alex's method is making this um, constancy assumption on the the, the relative risk within um, baseline covariate subgroups. Um, it, it's basically assuming that you know after you measure adherence or after you measure the immune marker. Um, and, and you set that same distribution it would have had in the previous trial, then within the baseline covariate levels, you're, you're going to get a, a constant relative risk um, treatment arm versus placebo. Uh, so, so that's that's tacitly assuming that your you know your baseline covariates and your your mediator is is capturing the key things that, that make the relative risks you know, equal. Um, and, and and you know the, the mediation uh, approach. Uh, all these methods need to make a no and measure confounders assumption uh, and do sensitivity to violation of that. And so, so they're assuming that we collect enough data uh, in the baseline covariates that, that is, you know, that are predicting both HIV infection and um, the, the intermediate outcome. Uh, so, so yeah, I think Alex high, highlighted an important difference between the mediation method and, and uh, Dave and Alex's methods. So, so generally, Dave and Alex's methods are, are going to be, um, I would say, uh, generally the, the preferred methods because they're going to use all the data, whereas the mediation method uh, is, is really anchoring on the subgroup of uh, vaccine recipients that has low immune responses. Or, or, or in the PrEP context, it would be the subgroup of trial participants that had the low PrEP adherence. And, and so if that subgroup is small, then there's not gonna be much precision. Um, but, but, but there's gonna be some examples where that subgroup might be fairly large, in, in which case the method should have good precision. So, so I see the use of the mediation approach as, as more of a, a, a complement to, to get um, uh, an additional answer on efficacy using quite a different assumption than the other methods. Um, and, and then one can examine the, uh, different assumptions to, to uh, try to understand the, the results better. And, and, and sometimes we'll have knowledge that there, there might be a really good mediator because in the, in the history of vaccine development, there, there's been many immune bi biomarks that have been accepted as mediators. So, so in, in those cases, um, it might work. Thanks. So Peter, while I have you, maybe I can ask you to comment a little bit further on the, the validation of this mediation assumption for the vaccine field. You know, how, do, how do you see this, the state of knowledge around this um, for, for HIV vaccines? And, and maybe what what might need to be the steps for, for validating this mediation assumption for future application of this framework? Yeah, so so we can roughly think of three categories 
there's more, I sh I, I'll get in trouble, of, of immune responses that people are trying to, you know, build up as surrogate endpoints and mediators that, you know, it's, it's broadly neutralizing antibodies. It's a whole cascade of non-neutralizing antibodies with, with various FC effector functions. And then it's various T cells. And, and a fourth category could be innate I I immunity. And I think there's progress on all those fronts. I, I think the, the, the BNABs are perhaps the, the simplest to build a case for credibility of, of a mediator um, because there's a, a history of non-human primate challenge studies showing BNABs coming through as the strongest correlate uh, you know, for, for the, um, the monoclonal antibody studies. And then, then also the AMP study is, is um, supporting the BNAB has promise as a mediator. But, but all those other uh, immune responses could also very well be mediators. And, and, and I think to understand mediation, one way to think about it is, is um, you know, what it's doing is, is once you deactivate a specific immune response that you're calling the mediator, then you get the efficacy down to zero. And, and so, so if you propose that, you know, a, a given immune response is a mediator and you deactivate it, but then there's some other immune response that's still there and there's still protection left, that meant that the mediator failed. So, um, and, and I think uh, ex experimentally in, in non-human private models, uh, you know, one can um, basically transfer different combinations of immune responses and uh, create the experimental conditions to try to prove what markers are needed for mediation. So, so Dave, what about for the prep field? So you started to talk about this, you know, what's the state of knowledge and with what validity can we actually infer um, that, that adherence is, is, a, is a good mediator for, for PrEP, given the issues that, that you touched on before, but expand on this. I failed to introduce myself before. I'm Dave Glidden from, I'm a professor of biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco. I think, I like the way Peter put it. All of these methods assume we have a right set of covariates and a right mediator. So in terms of kind of meeting these bridging assumptions, the issue about right covariates is that in the development of my prior, I used a fairly large number of covariates to infer that drug level uh, prevention efficacy relationship that was then imported. So that's always going to be important in the situation of PrEP. Um, and the second thing is that in terms of its value as a mediator, I use a particular measure of drug level pharmacology, which was the amount of uh, phosphorylated tenofovir in red blood cells, which tends to measure track with average pill taking in the previous month. So the situation that we face in PrEP is that no single biomarker of exposure can be a mediator at all times. The, uh, if we were to take, for instance, the case of on-demand PrEP, where people are taking PrEP for a couple of days around the time of their possible HIV exposure, then long-term measures of PrEP when people are uh, seen every three months cannot fully capture the effect of any retroviral exposure. So in some sense, we have to uh, deal with cases where people are instructed to take uh, tablets every day. And we're really dealing with surrogates of the mediator. That is the situation that we are in. One thing that does give me a lot of comfort, that Peter did also mention this, is that if we deactivate the exposure pathway, we should get no effect. And in the case of the adjusted uh, relationship between drug level exposure and rate of HIV, what we find is that in the Olay data, which I use as my basis, is that among those with really basically no real recent pill use, their rate of HIV acquisition is basically the same as it was in the placebo recipients. That gives us a lot of uh, additional comfort that in this context, it's working as a mediator. So, so given the um, 
you know, the, the different sources of the data and the inherent assumptions with regard to using them to, to do this bridging, you know, several of the speakers talked in their, in their presentations about the notion of using multiple sources of evidence and in some fashion, you know, combining um, the evidence either, either kind of informally by looking at them all or formally using a statistical framework that, that formally integrates the different pieces of information. Um, so I'd like to ask a couple of you to, to reflect on this and, and maybe starting with Sheila, you know, can you, can you loop back to that? What was the rationale for using the multiple sources of the data? And, and, um, and how do you think about, you know, combining these sources of data or looking at these multiple sources of the data, particularly in the context of clinical trials where we typically need, you know, one uh, primary analysis, at least for licensure based trials. So for this particular, for this particular issue, I think I think the, the one thing I'd have to say is we'd, we, we probably need to acknowledge that once we acknowledge the limitations of all our different approaches, we realize there's some room for ambiguity. There's room for, even though yes, I'm using the registration cohort um, over time and individuals risk, HIV risk may, may reduce. And there's not a long time, these one, two, three years, the, the HIV incidence may be reducing. There are several other factors at play that our limitation to all our different approaches. So I think trying to use one approach and then using it as the only, as the, the, the like in comparison to the traditional analysis where you know this is your, this is your placebo arm and you can confidently rely on it. In this case, I think it would be almost incorrect to try and assume that here and so acknowledge that yes, there'll be limitations and we need to probably have sensitivity analysis around this, consider different data sources and include them in the sensitivity analysis. That's what I would think of in this case, trying to, to get this perfect approach and then insist that it's actually a true placebo arm, I think is the wrong approach in this case. I don't know what else I would suggest, but sensitivity analysis to combine them. Right, great. And, and Dave as well, You this was a theme in your talk and in your case, you developed a single framework that integrated multiple data sources. Can you expand on that and what was the rationale? There? Yeah, so that is part of the reason that I'm trying to generate uh, enthusiasm around an approach based on Bayes is that if you're willing to write down parametric models, we have the ability to simultaneously incorporate something like biomarkers and possibly uh, a pre-trial incident and possibly something like recency. So a variety of different approaches could be integrated in calculating a counterfactual placebo rate and we're kind of using all the information together. I'd love to see that as a way that we um, approach things because this is a tool that is naturally meant for this. I think um, as we look at the different data sources, we've, we've emphasized a lot about assumptions and about bias, but I'm also concerned about variability as well. I just want to kind of want to stress that I think there's going to be a bias variance trade-off that's ubiquitous in statistics, and I think it's going to be relevant for, uh, for placebos. It is very possible that, you know, recent infections may, screening may turn up relatively few recent infections. The prep fact registrational cohort may potentially have relatively few infections during that time. And so we want to leverage all the data that we have. Yeah, and then, sorry, one, one more thing I'd say is, I guess we should now be more and more interested in the lower limits of the vaccine efficacy as opposed to um, the, the average, I, I don't know. And, and yeah, and then also we'd consider what approaches give us the more conservative estimate of the vaccine efficacy. I'd also be sort of interested in this idea is like, if you were sitting at the FDA in, the, in charge of this, um, you know, making a decision based on some of these estimates, um, do you think the, it's a good idea to basically do multiple analyses and your strategy be that they all give similar answers? Or do you think it's important <laughs> Would you as an FDA person basically say, no, you, you need to specify one as being primary and the others as supportive? What do you think we're likely to get there? 
one of the reasons I'm not an FDA person is I love being flexible. <laughs> but but let's let's imagine something like I'd love to see a standard based on all the evidence, and then be sure that when we remove perhaps one at a time different sources of evidence that we end up with relatively consistent uh, results. I love what Sheila said about, we really wanna look at that lower bound of the efficacy. And I would say Peter derived a sharp mathematically based lower bound, but we might think of Bayes as a way of kind of like smoothing out that idea of what's um, a plausible lower bound. So it's, it's more kind of a non-inferiority concept where it's kind of like, at least you could rule out it's not worse than this. So um, shifting perhaps to, to some practical issues with regard to the collection of the data that, that, that underlie, you know, each of these approaches, um, you know, I'd like, uh, you know, maybe to start with, with, with Faye and, and Sheila to, t to comment on the, the challenges, the practical challenges with regard to collecting the data from recency assays at screening and, and in Sheila's case, the, the registrational cohort, uh, perhaps with particular attention to the number of individuals, um, important to you know, the focus of st statisticians, uh, number of such individuals that one needs to do this and, 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 and associated with, they, with yours, you know, the, the, the other practical uh, challenges that you, that you touched on uh, briefly in your talk. Uh, probably I will start with the practical issue for collecting data, use, making use of recency assay. So for recency assay, our proposal is to apply recency assay to those HIV positive subjects in the screening population. And here we would like this uh, screen population to be representative or to be similar to the trial population. We well, later implement this active treatment of interest. So the most important challenge for now is that we will need to change our current practice of study screening in order to achieve this goal of uh, obtaining pretrial instance data. So currently to be more efficient to recruit subjects in the trial, usually a pre-screening is conducted to recruit only HIV negative subjects and to uh, introduce them to the later on protocol screening. Therefore, uh, for, uh, in, in the purpose of getting incidents from residency data, we'll need to change this procedure so that HIV positive subjects can be included in your screening. So in that case, we will need to educate people in the clinical research side about this new approach and what we exactly we need to obtain from screening so that we can collect the data we want. So in addition, there may be other challenges related to the screening procedure regarding more on this uh, representativeness of the screening population. For example, how we handle those who are on PrEP or who has previously using PrEP uh, coming to our uh, screening. And how do we handle those with recent HIV testing results since there were some uh, methodology challenges in uh, estimating incidents when the subjects, they have some uh, previous results on HIV. So those are still open questions and they need to be explored uh, and to overcome in order to more uh, better to uh, apply this type of approach. Yes, so for me, the limitations that I see, um, the, the primary one would be cost implications because uh, the, the whole idea, really the issue is uh, we're going to end up with, a, with need, requiring a very large sample size to power these two this trial with these two, with two, with these two active product arms, um, we need a very large sample size. So we add the registration cohort, but then at what point, at what point does the cost that you're spending on the registration cohort really, you could have just used that money to expand the sample size for this in the active trial and use a cheaper approach because the registration cohort does have cost implications. And then, um, yeah, the other bit of the, the other challenge also is that within the registration cohorts with um, with the increasing availability of HIV prevention interventions, the populations in the cohorts will start using those interventions as well. For example, if injectable PrEP was to become widely available, that now is the data you're getting into the cohorts. So already in the cohort, the, 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 the sample sizes that you require will grow larger and larger with, with time as we advance in HIV, so it would become less and less likely. And once again, still with its limitation of the time varying nature of HIV incidents. Um, and, and yeah, and generally trial populations are usually lower risk than cohort populations and how that would affect your analysis and 
So yeah, so there are definitely some challenges to it, but that can that can be addressed epidemiologically and statistically. I think. Sheila, I had one question for you. I, I know um, this registrational cohort um, has sometimes been um, kind of promoted as um, you always have this gap of time between when you um, envision a protocol going forward and, and the actual time it takes to launch the trial and get the approvals and that the registrational cohort can be done during that period. Um, I know you're currently doing the registrational cohort for PrEP back. Has that actually been the case that in the time it's taking you to launch the actual active um, control comparison in the vaccine trial, that there is this, this sort of natural gap in which you can do the registrational cohort? Um, yes, we, we're currently still conducting the registration cohort. However, we have already started enrolling participants. We've already, the trial has already started at one of our sites. So is there a gap in time that would allow this cohort? Yes, there has been um, a gap in time. And we have steadily recruited participants into the cohort, not, not in the single, not all at the same time point, but over time. So it keeps the cohort fresh. And once the trial starts, it enrolls participants from all levels of the cohort, whether they're recent entrance into the cohort or older. So it keeps kind of the incidence uniform over time. In a way. But yeah, there's, there's time to do that. Depends on the setting, I think. And, and for, you know, maybe, maybe Alex and, and Peter, you know, uh, the, the approaches that leverage instead uh, baseline variables and, and time varying, uh, you know, uh, mediator uh, variables, you know, in theory, um, th those should be e easier to employ with regard to the availability of the data. But, but can you elaborate on, on, you know, the challenges there with regard to having um, a similar set of, of baseline variables and, and time varying variables and, and the measurement of them uh, across the, the old setting and the new setting? Maybe starting with with uh, Alex? Sure, yeah, so, so certainly um, for, for our, the constancy assumption, I, I think this was in the particular talks that we gave, I think this was more relevant in, in my talk than, than Peter's because he, he didn't need to fuse data from two trials. Although I think he's thought about this question as well. Um, but, but certainly the validity of these constancy assumptions will be, I guess, most plausible um, in, in cases where we can condition on or, or look within strata defined by baseline covariates. Um, and so often the more baseline covariates that, that we can stratify by, the, the more plausible the assumption will be. Uh, but Holly, exactly as you pointed out, we, we do need these baseline covariates to be common between say a historical trial and a new trial that we're running now. Um, and, and on top of that, so, so though we don't explicitly condition on these time varying covariates, we, we do use them in, in any causal method, including the one that I talked, uh, that I spoke about, um, where I was thinking about sort of intervening um, on adherence and setting adherence um, to the levels that we would have seen in, in, uh, in the past trial, say. Um, yeah, yeah, we again need common time varying covariates measured at common time points across the two trials. Um, and, and so these, are, uh, th these aren't trivial requirements. I mean, so, so it certainly will require communication between study teams. Um, it, it, it's possible that this may be easiest within existing clinical trials networks. Um, if the, both studies were run within the same network, um, then naturally the new study team will have access to, to all of the, um, the, the CRFs and other information from the, the, the old study. Um, but, but otherwise I think it, we, we just need communication. So, so maybe just as a slightly more concrete example, like if, if uh, we're looking at a behavioral risk questionnaire to define some of the baseline variables, we really ideally would like to, to ask the exact same questions in the exact same way across the two trials. Yeah, yeah, just to add that I, I know both Dave and Alex have, uh, as they present their methods, they, they've noted that they really won't work for, what I would say, our very long bridges. Like if the previous study is Southern African women population and the new study is, you know, IVDU exposure, then, then you probably can't even try the, the, the method because because the vast differences between the, the populations, um, and then that's always going to be a problem. Uh, but, but but part of the logic of the mediator method is that uh, it, if if you're fortunate enough to have a, a a mechanism of protection, then it may be close to a universal mechanism where where if, if you get the level of BNAB high, then then it might work across settings. So 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 it, so it might possibly um, allow uh, 
you know, less collection of baseline covariates in, in, in principle. Um, but still, you'd, you'd have to val validate the assumptions about no unmeasured confounding and, and, and that, um, you know, the mediation works the same in the, in the, in the two settings. So, so I think this, the, the, your question highlights the, 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 probably the importance of networks to, to uh, you know, be able to standardize the data collection and, 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 and have a long view, uh, you know, to, to, to build the systems that are needed to um, get standard data collection. Um, a, couple, a couple of questions have actually um, come up that I wanted to ask um, from the audience. Um, one is really for you, Sheila. Does, does PrepVac plan to triangulate background incidents, I assume, from the, from the registrational cohort with some of the other methods? Um, for instance, looking at what Dave had done with Truvada. Yes, um, I, I don't know whether triangulate would be the right word, um, but we are considering different approaches, largely using sensitivity analysis to combine the data. So for example, in particular, we're using the registration court approach, yes, but then since PrepVac is also a vaccine trial where it will have a placebo arm, there's an opportunity to use some of the data from that placebo arm, but they're, really, they're allowed to be on some form of, of PrEP as well. Then we also are interested in what uh, Dave, I think, presented in regards to using the adherence to true, of true, true, true data to actually inform this placebo arm. So we're using several sources, mostly sensitivity analysis, and with the possibility of combining them. It's still being discussed. There was also another question. Um, which was given the potential bias of regional differences, would it be possible to organize multiple registration cohorts at various locations? Um, I'm gonna toss that one to Peter, because I think you might have some sense about um, what it would take to do something like that. So the idea would be that you, um, you run a, a cohort of people where you're measuring HIV incidence in settings where you might in the future do a vaccine trial. And, and if I can pile onto that, I mean, the, the, implicit in that is something, some, sometimes potentially this, this notion of sort of a ro rolling registrational cohort. I mean, that's sort of underlying your question. So yeah, I'm looking forward to you. You know, I, th I think even if you had registrational cohorts in, 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 in you know, very different settings, uh, like I, I mentioned kind of a, a a, lo a long bridge of, of uh, you know, sexual exposure of Southern African women, say IBDU exposure in, in Southeast Asia or something. Um, even if you had a registration of cohorts in the separate places, the, 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 the covariates, the, the Mason covariates X would probably mean something different. So, so it might be hard to, you know, ju justify the kind of constancy assumptions. But, 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 I, I, uh, but on the other hand, um, w within the class of say IBDU or, or uh, you know, mucosal exposure for subject after women, then, um, yes, absolutely. I think having registrational cohorts within each class would, would, would enable these methods. I think one comment I would make then is I, I think one of the challenges whenever I've discussed things like registrational cohorts is what Sheila mentioned, which is the cost. Like, who is it that's actually going to pay for these people to be followed, not on a product? And um, it, it may be that um, there's a future that we haven't seen before where um, for the vaccine trials um, in particular, um, this really is an, a necessary um, adjunct or a necessary source of external data for proving vaccines work in the future. But it's certainly a, um, there would need to be a groundswell of support and um, some guarantees, which never happen. So, some support from the from the from the regulatory agencies that this is an important data source. I think in order to get funding for anything like registrational cohort. Um, I mean, it's it's great to see in the prep vac um, that that you did manage to get funding for a registrational cohort prior to your trial. But I think standalone registrational cohorts that aren't tied to a trial, like I could imagine, they might be very challenging to get funding to do them. So, so um, I'd like also to, to, to loop back to the, 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 the planning that it might take to employ this cross-sectional incidents idea. So, so Faye in particular and anyone else who wants to comment, um, given the practical challenges that you've raised, you know, are there things that could be done by networks in particular 
to, to lay the groundwork for application for this method um, to future efficacy trials. Faye and, and anyone else who wants to comment as well. This uh, instance estimation based on recent assay. So uh, it has uh, many challenges in actually implementing it when we uh, in the future uh, really want to implement a trial. And then uh, I feel like one very important thing that the network can support is in terms of, because uh, uh, I, I mentioned that one major challenge is in terms of we're tr really changing what we used to do in, in terms of how we do the trial, in terms of how we conduct this uh, screening procedure. So I think one main uh, support that the network can provide is in terms of education. So basically we need to make sure that this, uh, for example, the uh, first of all the statistician and then later on for those who are actually implementing the trial actually understand what's going on and like why, what's the main reason that the screening procedure needs to be changed and then what kind of pitfall can we fall into if uh, some of the, uh, issues or some, if if like, for example, some of they are not collected for us to address the representatives of this uh, cross-sectional instance uh, data. So I think that's one very, yes. There's a question in the chat, which is actually relevant. And I, I don't know that we've really thought about it before. Uh, sorry, it's in the Q&A, beg your pardon. And um, Connie asked, mm -hmm. do you need to do ARV drug testing in the registrational cohort and or amongst those testing for recency of infection when they're screening out? Because it seems like you want to know the proportion of people who are actually on PrEP so that you can factor that into your estimate of HIV. Is that a problem that, um, I mean, I'll, I'll ask it of you and, and also um, Sheila, if you want to respond, is this something that you think is necessary? Yes, I think it's it's 100% necessary. If you, you intend to use this data as your placebo, um, you need to know that they're on some sort of PrEP. At least for the registration court, we are co collecting the data on uptake and use of PrEP. So it informs us, I do not feel it. So. Yeah, from the case of recent assay, usually this ARV drug use is will be affecting the performance of recent assay we are using. And also, uh, if a, if someone is using ARV drug, then it is more indicated that the subjects will be long infected. So it might will be less likely to be reason in our algorithm. So I think people are working on trying to incorporate this ARV drug testing into rinsing assay tests in order to have more accurate performance of instance estimation. So you're basically saying in the recency approach, it's more likely that you would actually exclude people who were on PrEP as part of your evaluation, like as part of the, the people who are counted as being in the cohort for the recency would exclude people if they were on PrEP probably. Uh, right, I think, uh, one one reason for that is because for yeah the yeah. AR retesting yeah, yeah that, that's a separate question about like using prep right that that's kind of a bigger question it's like yeah but for AR retesting uh, we are trying to so basically if someone is on ARV their uh, recent assay readings will not be the, the same as someone else who's not taking ARV drug so in that case it's better to uh, exclude them and especially given that they're more likely to be lung infected. Yeah, Connie had a follow-up there. She's obviously restricted to Q&A. She said, given the ARV testing and other aspects of these registrational cohorts and, and the, it, you know, she said, be useful to know the cost of registrational cohorts and the cost of recency testing as sponsors anticipate incorporating these approaches in future trials. So I don't think we have to respond to that, but um, cost is clearly an issue. Uh, so I think we have time for one more very quick question. Does anyone want to comment on the, uh, another uh, source of data uh, that's been mentioned for, for inferring incidents, which is uh, incidents of other STIs? I think, Dave, you touched on it a little bit in your talk. Are there, you know, um, what's the value in that source of data? And, and, and are there any other buckets that, that we ought to be um, throwing into the, 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 the bucket of considerations here that we haven't talked about yet? At least Maybe the Dave. proposed methods, yeah, sure. At least the proposed methods for incorporating STIs depends on a knowledge base which involves aggregate data from just a few studies. And I think the concern is that those contexts are contexts that may represent a long bridge in the sense of time and may not fully incorporate treatment as prevention. So treatment as a prevention is something that uh, we're all 
concerned about in our incidence estimates and how it may affect uh, the, the context with, that we're bridging from to the context that we're bridging to. So I think some of the advantages of the approaches that we've talked about is that recency is a, is a relatively shorter time duration and that when we use a, an, an immune marker or an ARV marker, we're in a concurrent era. So uh, STIs are intriguing and certainly plausible, uh, but I think our knowledge base in terms of the data to import to infer is one that is older and may lead to overestimates. In the case of the DISCOVER trial, at least a quite high HIV incidence estimates on the order of seven or eight per hundred person years. Um, I, we are right coming up on the hour and I know we just had a, we, a question just came up. We're not going to be able to respond to um, unless someone wants to write up a I can answer what I'm talking. So first of all, I just wanted to thank all of the panelists for the time you put into your talks. They are really interesting talks. And for those of you who haven't had the time to listen to them, I would recommend them to you. They, they don't take that long. Um, I wanted to thank you all for, sh for showing up and all the hard work of the organizing group um, and Roger and your group. It's been wonderful to have this chance to talk to each other. So Holly, if you want to close us out. Thank you very much to the speakers and, and uh, look forward to future conversations. And, and we hope to um, put out some sort of uh, written synthesis of, of these talks uh, after the fact for, for us all to um, move this conversation forward. So thank you. And I'll shift over to Roger to close this out. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Holly and Deborah. Thank you very much, to, very much to all who attended and participated today. I'd like to thank uh, you all and, uh, and my colleague in the organizing committee and the organization who contributed and supported this webinar. I would like to draw your attention to complementary work done by our colleague at the Forum for Collaborative Research and also by EVAC. We're all working towards building research literacy. The next panel discussion will be on trials of monoclonal antibodies for HIV prevention. It will be followed by uh, our final event, which will be on the meaningful engagement of community in clinical trial design. All presentation and panel discussion are available on the enterprise website, and we'll send a short survey after this event. This is very helpful for us to, to design them. Again, thank you very much. Have a good day or a good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>